Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's webinar, Imposters, Rogue Users, and Other Unwelcome Guests on Your Network, brought to you by SpectreSoft and Dark Reading and broadcast by United Business Media Limited. I'm Tim Wilson, Editor-in-Chief of Dark Reading, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. This webcast contains audience polling. The polling question will appear in the slide presentation window. Please complete the poll when they appear and click on the Submit Answer button located in the polling slide window. Thanks in advance for your participation. You can participate in the Q&A session by asking questions at any time during this webinar. Just type your question into the Q&A text area located to the right of the presentation window and then click the Submit button. At this time, we recommend you disable your pop-up blockers. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the Additional Resources button located below the presentation window. If you're experiencing any technical problems, please visit our webinar help guide by clicking on the help link below the presentation window. In addition, you can contact our technical support helpline, which is also located in the webinar help guide. And now on to the presentation. Uh, imposters, rogue users, and other unwelcome guests on your network. Um, this is a, a, a really interesting topic for, for us at uh, Dark Reading and really looking forward to um, having these guys kind of walk through it with you. We're doing a, a little bit of, of a different presentation today. Normally we, we have a, a couple of speakers who kind of talk one after the other, but we're going to do it a lot more interactively today. So we hope that you in the audience will participate as much as possible. You can ask questions. We'll have some poll questions. We'll ask you some questions, and we're going to bring in um, the uh, three different speakers, all, all of whom are experts on this topic, from who come, come at it sort of from different angles. So let me start by introducing uh, the three speakers who will be with us today. Uh, our first speaker will be John Sawyer, a senior security analyst within Guardians, um, where John specializes in network mobile and web application penetration testing. John's developed and taught cybersecurity training for a large university and spoken at events for industry and law enforcement. He's consulted with federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies on malware analysis, hacker attacks, and digital forensics. Uh, John, John is, is a, a blogger for Dark Reading, he's, uh, and he's been a member of the winning team from DEF CON 14 and DEF CON 15's Capture the Flag competition. Hi, John. How are you doing? Hey, Tim. I'm doing well. Thank you. Our uh, second speaker will be uh, Vince Burke, who's co-founder and CEO of FlowTrack. Um, Vince has nearly two decades of experience defending and securing large networks and is the designer of the FlowTrack system. His background in high-performance computing and secure network engineering ultimately led to the development and commercialization of FlowTrack, which is a very highly scalable network security product. Um, formerly, Vince led the development of the Intermapper Flows pro product, which is deployed in thousands of government and university and private sector customer sites. Hi, Vince. How are you doing? Glad to be here, Tim. Our, our third speaker is uh, Mike Tierney, who's the Chief Operating Officer at Spectrosoft. Uh, Spectrosoft is a leader in user activity monitoring and an innovator in user behavior analytics. Um, they've developed uh, software that helps businesses identify and detect insider threats, condu conduct efficient and accurate investigations, and enhance productivity. Mike's responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the company, and he's been working with the, the product for, for a while now and, and is uh, one, of, one, of, one of the smart guys when it comes to behavior analytics. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Good, Tim. Great to be here. Well, uh, with that, I want to um, start out with a discussion of um, – the, the problem of imposters on your network. We talk a lot about, in, in, as we look in security, we talk a lot about lateral movement and what, what attackers do when they get on your network and they become what amounts to a, a user. Um, and uh, John, as a, uh, as a specialist in pen testing, does this on a regular basis. And so he's going to walk us through the, 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 the problem, the, the, the threat, and, and how attackers get on the network and, that, and what they do when they get there. And then, we're gonna, then I'll, uh, I'll have uh, Vince and, and Mike give some, some thoughts on this topic, and then, then we'll launch into some questions. So, John, why don't you uh, take it away? Thanks, Tim. I'd be happy to. 
So one of the things and questions that we, we face when we first start looking at our clients' networks is who, who's on the network? And while the clients typically have a, have a good idea that, you know, their users are on the network, they don't necessarily know if there's any bad guys or, or imposters that are on the network. How do they know that their, their employees aren't, aren't doing something malicious behind their backs? You know, maybe they're pilfering customer information and selling it to a competitor, or maybe they're stealing files and transferring it off to a remote file share site, or maybe there's a, a, a malicious attack that's occurred that has allowed a, a remote attacker to gain access into the network. You know, the, the problem that a lot of companies face that we, we talk to is that they don't necessarily have the monitoring in place, they don't have the logging systems in place in order to determine who's actually on the network and figure out at any given time where a user is or who's behind an IP or if that system is one that belongs on the network or not. So this is one of the fundamental problems that we're, we're trying to answer and, and look at when we start talking about who's on the network and do you have any rogue users or imposters that are are on the network and, and doing things that are behind your back and maybe pilfering money, files, trade secrets, all types of things. Now this slide right here, we take a look, quick look at some of the current threats and objectives. And kind of what I wanted to point out here, and this is, this is a table that I pulled from a, a great presentation that was at RSA conference earlier this year. And it looks at uh, several of the different threats. You have your viruses, worms, and spam, insiders, hacktivists, ter terrorists, organized crime, and state-sponsored attackers. And now when we look at each of those, we start looking at the objectives, and we see that insiders, they typically look at revenge and financial gain. So when you're looking at your network and you're trying to determine, okay, is there, there's someone doing something bad on my systems, and you, you need to kind of look and figure out, what are those critical systems that I need to be protecting, and, and where are, uh, where's the crown jewels in my organization now? Do I know what activity is going in and out of those systems at all times? Do I have logs for those systems? You know, those are the things that you're going to want to monitor and figure out, okay, what's standard behavior? Are there any interesting log entries I need to monitor for? Are there users outside of groups that are trying to access file shares that they shouldn't be? You know, these are things that could indicate that you might have one of these different threats uh, or attackers on your network actively trying to gain access to information trying to steal that data when you're not looking. And they're going to be using some of the same things that regular users and regular sysadmins would be using as they're moving laterally through the network. Now the question that comes up is, how do imposters get into the network? How are they infiltrating and gaining access in the first place? Well, most often what we see is social engineering. Now, from a, both a defense and an offense side, I know that when I worked for a very large university and dealt with a, a massive uh, population of students, faculty, staff, one of our biggest issues was social engineering. You know, they were people falling victim to phishing attacks, uh, watering hole attacks, instant messaging, all different types of uh, social engineering attacks designed to um, trick a user into gaining access to their credentials, which would then eventually get them into the network, let's say via uh, VPN or remote desktop or Citrix, something like that. Now, there's also remote exploitation. Suppose an attacker has found a vulnerability in, in your web server, and they're able to exploit, let's say, SQL injection. They get a shell on the box. They then are able to pivot maybe into an internal network or somewhere where they would start gaining access to internal network resources just as if they were a uh, regular user or uh, you know, someone that was an insider on the network. You know, how would you be able to detect that? You know, what is it that's going to trigger an alert that might bring an analyst or someone from your security team in to drill down and figure out what's actually going on? You know, what are those system events and things that you should be looking for? Rogue employees, you already have employees that are trusted on your network. If some, one of them becomes unhappy for some reason, suppose they may start stealing files. They might start going into the customer database and pulling all the records out of there so that they can then take that to their next job. Well, do you have something in there that's going to be able to detect that, hey, this user who normally uh, executes you know, maybe 20 or 30 queries an hour just executed 
150,000 queries against the database or returned 150,000 records uh, for you know, a customer or table that has all the information that they would be a great database to, to take with a new job and give them a jump start. So the, the picture I included on this, on this slide is because you know, to me as a pen tester, uh, when I'm trying to get in, most often it's just walking around the defense. You, know, you can see there's this gate in this picture and everybody's just been driving around. And that's, that tends to be what happens you know, in a lot of pen tests. Now, once imposters are inside the network, and, and I'll touch on what we do as uh, pen testers, and we leverage some of the same tools and techniques that the attackers are using. Because what we do is we, monitor, we perform incident response, we look at forensics, we do cases where we see what attackers are doing. So we take that information, we take threat intelligence from uh, different sources, and we try to pull that together so that we can tailor a, a test that would be very specific to a type of threat that you might face. So if we're looking from the insider perspective, let's say you do have a user that went rogue, or maybe you have someone who was able to walk in the front door, plug in a, a laptop or a pwn plug or some mini computer that gives them remote access into uh, your network. What's going to happen then? Well, one of the big things is we try to live off the land. And when I talk about living off the land, we're looking at native system tools, you know, things that are included with the Windows, Linux, and Mac operating systems that might be in use within a uh, company's network. So for example, on Windows, when we gain access to Windows systems, we leverage things like PowerShell, NetSH uh, to modify the firewall rules, WMIC for system calls. But a lot of times it's just these native tools that if you have something that like application whitelisting in place, these are tools that are going to already be whitelisted. They're going to be tools that are seen running on a normal system because they're, they're Microsoft binaries, they're signed, they're trusted. So as an attacker, it's great to be able to use these tools. I mean, you're essentially using uh, an attacker's weapon against, you know, your, your enemy's we weapon against them in this case. And it's stuff that's not going to necessarily raise a red flag unless you're doing some type of user, profi user, mm, user profiling on each system. You know, that's going to see little deviations in, in user behavior. Um, common sysadmin tools, PS tools, uh, if you're a sysadmin, you know these well. If you're a pen tester, you probably know them even better. Uh, file shares are a fantastic source of information. I can tell you numerous, numerous penetration tests that we've done where once we had access to the internal network, all it was was a matter of using our regular user credentials that had no administrative rights to map to shares and start looking for information that would eventually give us some type of privilege escalation into other systems, you know, maybe administrator access on the boxes we're on now or root into Linux systems or, or something that's, you know, going to be really nice juicy details. For example, we were working on a test a couple years ago where we gained access to a share and as we're looking around, um, we were a financial user, but we could access IT's uh, share. And in there were results from a previous security audit of Unix systems and it had all the password and shadow files. So we easily grab those and start cracking them with John the Ripper and suddenly we had a root on a whole bunch of Linux systems. SharePoint, wikis are fantastic sources of information. This is another area where imposters uh, and rogue users on your network will start pilfering information to try to learn about your network and what's going on inside there. And the local file system, of course, is a fantastic area. If you happen to gain access to the right system, you may find a wealth of information. You know, if it's an IT person, if it's a developer, all kinds of access to great stuff. Now, what are some of the things that imposters exploit once they're, you know, what is it that allows them to gain access into these systems and maintain access and go unnoticed for a long time? Well, most often we see it's, a, it's an issue with staffing. There's understaffed IT and understaffed security teams, or not even a security team. It's usually one or two guys and their sysadmins, and they have to wear a, a security hat at the same time. So they can't really do the proper monitoring and uh, alerting and everything of all their systems, including the, you know, each endpoint servers and the network at the same time. They just don't have the time. 
There's insufficient network segmentation and security controls. We see this all the time. Companies will go through the trouble of segmenting their network into logical subnets, but then they don't put any network security controls. There's no firewalls, ACLs, nothing in between those networks to actually provide true segmentation. It's just broadcast domain at that point, and no one really you know, uh, goes any further unless they've been compromised and realized what a sit sitting duck they really are. Um, and then uh, default credentials, still such a common, common issue that we see. If you're able to plug into a network and then just take a look at interesting management ports like TCP 8080 or 9090 or 8443 or something along those lines, just do a quick scan, just look across the local subnet, looking to see if there's anything that you might be able to connect to and gain access to without crossing subnets where you might get you know, picked up by an IDS or something. And this is just you know, part of trying to be stealthy and, and uh, you know, prevent anyone from seeing any activity that might clue them in to, that something fishy is going on. And then I mentioned uh, file shares. That's a huge area that um, we're able to exploit all the time. Now, detection and prevention. There's a whole lot in this slide and the next slide, and I'm not going to go through every little bit, but the slides will be available uh, afterwards. And so I highly recommend that you take a look at this slide and the next one, because there's some really great information in here as far as um, how to prevent some of these uh, things that allow ta attackers, once they're in, to move laterally from you know, system to system. And one of those is uh, disable remote process and service creation. Now, as a, a pen tester, you know, we regularly use PSExec and PowerShell uh, to execute things on remote systems. Now, they tend to create a, a service when that happens. And by preventing that uh, remote service creation, you're killing a, a whole class of, of attacks right there that allow, allow pen testers and uh, other attackers in. Um, scan for default credentials and change them. Absolutely, this is low-hanging fruit that's normal. Audit your domain admins group and limit absolutely only those accounts that are necessary. And make sure you're logging all those events. Make sure you log in successful domain admin logins because once one of those accounts is compromised, I mean, it, who, who cares if, they're, if you're logging all the failed audits? You know, you want to know where that person is logging in. Uh, and that's the key, key right there. And on this next slide, detection and prevention again, understand and protect your systems. This is a, a big issue that I, I run into regularly with clients where if we're doing a pen test or incident response, they don't necessarily understand some of the systems that are on their network well enough. So trying to go in and plan for uh, an incident and then get all the information that's necessary to provide uh, proper support for that gets very, very difficult. So these are all recommendations for things that will help provide endpoint protection. Um, and uh, please, I highly recommend it because I, I can tell you from experience as, a, as an attacker, um, these are all things that will help slow down the attacker and generate noise in your logs and help alert you and detect that an attacker is actually in there and doing bad things. Um, and we're going to have a great discussion. I'm really looking forward to today. And I'm going to hand it back over to Tim Wilson. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, John. That, that was a great um, uh, uh, chance for us to see from a pen tester's point of view what, how um, folks get on the network and what they do once they get there. Um, our next speaker is, is Vince Burke, who, who can, uh, you brought up a, a bunch of the network security issues, and, and Vince has been looking at that issue for, for a long time now. And, and um, Vince, let me, let me uh, let you introduce yourself and, and, and talk us through a little bit uh, what you've seen um, in this space. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, I'm, uh, <clears throat> my name is Vince Burke, and uh, um, we uh, build and provide the Flowtrack software, which is a, a network visibility and behavioral analysis tool. And uh, w we focus on the network side of the equation, and we, we frequently actually find ourselves installed at the same um, uh, environments where, where Mike is providing visibility um, into the systems um, uh, and the individual host endpoints. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the types of people that um, that are typically deploying and looking for these types of threats um, 
you know, will range from security teams to um, the actual cyber hunters, which is which is a special class of security professional that that actively analyzes network for um, behaviors that are out of the ordinary, which could either be users making many more login requests than they normally do, suspicious data movements, and what have you. All of these things can be indicators of potential insider threats. And when we um, when we get into environments and we um, provide people visibility inside their network, and I, this is very important, that point that uh, what we're talking about here is, is network visibility inside the network, not just the border. Um, you know, the better the visibility, and the more visibility from different angles you can get, the better chance you stand on actually catching insiders on your network. Um, and then sort of the types of, of um, behaviors that we tend to catch and help people with, um, they break down into three categories of increasing sort of difficulty to detect and do something on your network. Um, sort of the drive-by shooters, um, the first ones, um, they, you know, often are simply harvesting hosts on your network for um, for their botnets, DDoS attacks, and what have you. Um, frequently, the first class of imposter on your network does not necessarily realize what they've just broken into and the kinds of resources that they may have available to, um, you know, to them for, for theft or subversion, you know, um, espionage or sabotage, if you will. Um, the second category, um, I know this is an acronym that's been, been overused, but it does classify exactly the kinds of outside threats on your network that you need to be aware of, and it's also the types of threats that John spoke about the most. Um, advanced persistent means somebody who has skills and somebody who has time and somebody who has um, targeted you specifically. So you're not just, um, you know, you, you didn't get hacked because you were easy to hack. Somebody um, from the outside had a specific reason, um, you know, either ideology, monetary gain, why they wanted to be on your network. And thus, they have time and they can take their time um, infiltrating, and they're typically much harder to find because they know how to stay uh, quiet. Finally, the hardest type of, um, of imposter on your network to find and do something about is somebody who knows everything about your network because they're an insider. They know where the assets are. They know what accounts they might need to subvert to get their hands on those assets, and they know possibly what types of countermeasures you have in place and they can strategically work around them so they're even harder to find. Um, visibility and behavioral analysis on multiple levels in your network and on your host is actually key on finding these. Now, what do we do on a network layer to try to detect them? There's a lot of different behaviors. I, I wanted to point out only a couple that we can talk about today, but there's a lot of different behaviors to look for. Typically scanning behavior. Um, John pointed it out, scanning behavior is harder to see on subnets, but we can use switches to actually detect that. Um, reconnaissance is very important because it tells the individual what is available, what might be exploitable, um, and what kind of resources and protections may be in place, right, depending on what kind of responses come back. So, so when we see scanning behaviors on the network, even if it's a slow scan, it is often a sign of something that shouldn't be happening possibly an imposter of any of these classes on your network. Um, one very important thing to always pay attention to, things that we, we, um, we work very hard on detecting, is what are new services spring up on your network. And with that, I mean um, a service that actually responds and wasn't there before inside your network. And you know, it's, it's, it, this could be anything from a file share being spun up on a workstation, a sub-7 uh, server, uh, remote desktop uh, capabilities that are being used that typically either aren't used or shouldn't be used from the client or location that they're being used from. Um, connections to blacklisted system, uh, systems like Zeus Tracker, um, you know, the variety of other command and control channels and malware channels, any connections to, to systems to bring malware in is a definite red flag. Um, Data exfiltration behaviors, and this is truly a behavioral thing. Um, for instance, you know, uh, when we look in, in the medical record space, typical um, queries to medical records are in the orders of maybe um, 20 to 100 per individual per day. If this becomes 1,000 in a couple of minutes, you know, 
that is an event that you should be paying attention for. So, so there's a lot of behaviors that, that can be seen on the network layer that can give you a clue as to what is happening or, um, or you know, cue you into what the next steps need to be. Because as with many of these sort of behaviors and typical things that you might find on a network or on a host, um, usually by itself it's not a conclusion. It is a, it is a radar blip that might require further investigation depending on how severe you believe it is and what the asset is that is being hit. So, um, so then what? Um, you know, typically visibility from multiple angles, collecting additional information, full fidelity, um, traffic analysis, um, and sometimes, you know, like what our Cyber Hunt customers do, you carefully watch and you pay attention to what the attacker is doing and learn as much about them as you can before you actually make your move. So, Tim, that is going to be my, my introduction to the topic. I'll give it back to you now. Thanks, Vince. That, um, that was great. And, and, and I think now we'll have a, a chance to, to kind of see it from the other side. You talked about the, what's happening on the network side. Um, Mike, why don't you talk us a, a little bit through the, 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 what you, users can do as far as user behavior analytics and, and that sort of thing? Oh, sure, I'd be happy to, Tim. So, you know, we, we do come at this from a different perspective, and the, the information that John and Vince have, have just passed along is, is outstanding, and I'll, I'll see if I can build on that a little bit. Because I think, you know, part of, you know, to, to, to build on what Vince said, part of that um, need for visibility is to really look at things um, in, in as holistic a, an approach as you can. Um, so what we do at Spectrosoft is we actually focus on people and, and human interaction with the resources and accesses they've been given or for the purposes of our topic today that perhaps they've taken, right? And we, we try to do that in a couple of different ways to present as complete a picture of what's happening um, related to the users on the network, whether they're users you've authorized to be there or they're users you're, that are impersonating um, folks you've authorized to be there. Um, to sort of round out the picture that's being created um, through more traditional logging and through some of the, the, the powerful logging and visibility that, that a tool like Vince's can bring, um, and to really ensure that there isn't any gray um, that, that response when one of those radar blips comes up that does warrant a response um, can be informed and can take place rapidly and put you, um, you know, to use a very, very technical term, right on the bogey in terms of what you're focusing on. Um, and then also to, to have that information available, it's required to do more full-featured investigations, um, um, both that you could use for uh, tightening up your processes and your security posture going forward, uh, but also um, that you can use for evidentiary purposes if that becomes necessary. Um, so we do that in, in a couple of different ways. The two highlights, and the one you asked about, Tim, are user behavior analytics, right? And, and what user behavior analytics is all about is establishing what normal looks like. Um, you know, what is the normal behavior of the people on your network, again, as it relates to the resources and the accesses that they've been given? Um, and then flagging when there's a deviation or an anomaly from that normal that suggests threat, right? Um, you know, user behavior analytics has emerged as a space that is solely focused on the detection of insider threats, right? Whether those are, you know, threats to data security um, or financial fraud type of, uh, type of things. Those are the two main use cases. And, um, you know, as we talked about, a very different perspective because it does focus on the people aspect to, to kind of round out the technical aspects as well. The user activity monitoring um, other side of the coin that we do um, is uh, a little bit deeper dive focus. So that's going to revolve around collecting um, and logging activity data, but again, focused on the, on the human activity. Um, and it becomes a very rich contextual data source. So everything that's happening behind that alert, behind that radar blip is available, and that's where you really get uh, the ability to move um, faster in terms of response and uh, investigation and to come out with a, a result that is, you know, while you're probably not dealing with an ideal situation at that point, um, you know, the kind of result that you need to get to when you're in that situation. You know, and one of the things that, that – uh, resonated for me uh, when we started talking about this and putting this together 
um, and, and we focused on the imposter. You know, my, you can see up on the slide here, we talk about different types of insider uh, archetypes, if you will. But the one, the, the one reason that this imposter stood out for me is one that I thought um, an audience might like to hear a discussion on is, is, is I go back and look at some of the really high profile and some of the, the lower profile um, breaches that have occurred recently, there's a recurring theme in here. You look back at the target breach, and you know I, I've seen quite a few reports on that that use phrasing like an intruder stole a vendor's credentials and then use that to impersonate the vendor and get in. Um, the Anthem breach in January of this year, sorts of the breach appeared to have been a compromised login credential, again, an imposter. And that attacker originally ran a database query using a system admin's credentials, so they targeted privilege. Um, and then they got in, they uploaded data to a cloud storage service. Um, there was a, a, lesser, a lesser publicized one, a, a company called SendGrid, um, back in February, March, in that time frame. An employee account was compromised by a cyber criminal, and in turn, a customer, one of SendGrid's customers, and their data was breached. Um, luckily, nothing overly valuable there, but the theme continued. And then, you know, the OPM hack. Um, you know, the, the big one up on the federal level where, it, you know, everything appears that an intruder, an intruder stole uh, a vendor key point uh, credentials and used that to get in and then employ some of the very tactics that, you know, Vince and John were talking about. So, so for me, this topic really resonates, and uh, I, I think it's going to be an interesting discussion as we go forward. Thanks, Mike. Um, this is a, uh, you guys have really given us a, a good viewpoint on, you know, kind of where um, enterprises are, um, you know, how imposters get in, how you can detect them, that sort of thing. Um, I want to remind the audience that you can ask questions of any of these guys uh, during the course of the, the presentation. All you have to do is, um, you know, press the submit answer uh, button on your uh, on your screen and you'll be able to, to ask it ask a question um, I'm going to ask you a question and th at this point um, we wanted to, to find out kind of where we, the audience thinks they are with imposters on the network right now and so we're starting with a, a real simple uh, question do you believe your enterprise has imposters on its network today and so a is no we have systems in place to detect them B, yes, I'm concerned that we do, or C, I don't know, and I'm not sure how we would detect them if we did. So um, if, uh, if the audience can put in their, their answers, we'll, we'll um, uh, give, a, give you a sense for, for where we are. Um, guys, uh, you know, as you look at this, do, you know, and, and maybe um, you know, Mike and Vince, you can talk a little bit about what you see in, in customer sites. Do most uh, enterprises know that they have imposters on the network? You know, Tim, um, this is Vince. That's actually an interesting uh, uh, question. The, the question you just asked of the audience is one that I that I sometimes ask of people that are thinking about um, about seeking these, you know, imposters or, or or threats on their network. And it's sort of like the, the answers break down in, in two classes. One class of people that say that they cannot certainly uh, say and they don't know for sure if there's imposters on their network. And then the other group of people that say that they're absolutely positive that they don't have any, and, and then I know that those are lying. So that is probably how that would break down for me. Yeah, I think, Vince, you know, I don't disagree with you. I think that the, um, the people that are in the absolutely sure category that they don't, I think you'd find a large percentage of those aren't actually looking for it, um, at least not with enough specificity to be able to detect it. And what they're really getting, what they're really telling you is we've never seen one, um, which is very different from we don't have any. You know, if you, and if you run through, you know, some of what, like John talked about earlier, you know, a, a users operating um, outside of the groups that normally access certain resources, if you're not looking for those types of things, if you're not understanding what normal behavior looks like, whether it's network behavior um, or, or user behavior, you, you can't find those deviations that are going to start to point you into you may have a problem. So I, I agree with you, Ben. But it's also, you know, Mike, when I, when I look at this, it is a, it's a fundamental, we're both in the business of providing visibility, of providing an ability to analyze and see deeper than people have been able to see before. 
And once you see something, you can't unsee it any longer. And there rarely is a situation where, where we come onto a network you know, where people don't, within minutes, find things they were unaware of, patterns, behaviors, you know, data movements, activities that either shouldn't be there or they didn't think were going to be there and that warrant looking first. The moment you, you open the eyes, people understand, like, you know, there were things we didn't see before and therefore we weren't worried about them. Well, I think we are, I, I just uh, pushed our, our results out to the audience and uh, I think um, their, their response gives um, some credence to what you guys were saying. I think we, uh, the biggest response is I'm, I'm don't, I don't know and I'm not sure how we would detect them if we did. Um, I, you know, I think clearly we have, uh, you know, the majority of, a, of an audience that, that is either, you know, concerned that, that they do have imposters or don't know. And um, you know, so I think that it's clear that there's there's a big base of of folks who are st who are wrestling with this today. Uh, let me ask you, uh, as um, all three of you, um, how you know we've talked a little bit about malicious insiders. We've talked a little bit about um, the the external you know attackers who get on the network and appear to be users. Is there, are there ways that you can kind of tell the difference, or does it matter, um, you know, as you look at their behavior, um, do they do the same things, or do they do different things, or give us some sense for what the difference is between a malicious user and, a, and an external hacker who, who is using uh, uh, what appear to be, you know, authorized credentials? Any, anybody? So this is John. Um, I, I would say from the the malicious insider standpoint, they're going to be using more uh, of the native tools that they use every day. Uh, they might start accessing additional shares and websites that they don't normally access. Um, so that could be something that, that triggers because now they're accessing areas outside of what's normal for their everyday behavior. From a, a malicious attacker who's gained access from the outside and is now inside, there tends to be more mistakes because they're trying to feel their way around the network. And depending on how fast they need to get in and out uh, depends on how many more mistakes they're going to make in the beginning. You know, They might have to touch more shares uh, more rapidly, uh, which would be an indicator. Uh, they might start scanning uh, for certain ports that management interfaces are on that might trigger some activity. Uh, so you're going to see more probing uh, to identify systems that are out there um, and possibly passive monitoring where they're trying to watch users and get a better idea and understanding of what resources are out there so that they can then go after them. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, in terms of the malicious insider versus the, the external actor or the imposter, you're going to have different opportunities to flag a malicious insider. And I agree with John that the, the, the imposter is going, to, is going to stumble more often because they're, you know, in some ways they're, they're operating in a dark hallway. Um, you know, with the malicious insider, you have, you have different opportunities, um, potentially more opportunities um, to flag their behavior. You, know, you, can, you can certainly look at technical indicators, um, you know, accesses that are out of a normal pattern, um, application usage that, that is not normal, um, usage, you know, maybe uploads of data that, are, that is out of band. Um, but you also have the ability to look at, at uh, more psycholinguistic indicators that wouldn't be available if, if you're dealing with an imposter. So there are ways that you can, you can understand um, a little bit about, you know, what might be driving someone if you apply some analysis to communication. So you can look at things like tone and intensity of communication and shifts in different language patterns that may be taking place on your corporate network that might help to throw a flag that wouldn't otherwise exist. And then the malicious insider is also going to have, um, if their goal is to exfiltrate data, which I think is, is the most common, uh, most common goal, they're going to have more options to do that, to get the data off the network. They don't simply have to get it to a remote server. Um, you know, they, could, they could go very old school and print it, um, or they can, you know, move it to portable storage. So you have some other areas where you can try to look for anomalistic behavior, um, and and that may that may help you a little bit uh, with a malicious insider versus an imposter. 
Okay. Um, I'm going to um, move on to uh, the, the next audience poll question. It's, it's um, right along the lines of the question that I wanted to ask you all, um, which is, does your organization currently have a way to baseline employee behavior so that you can recognize potential anomalies? You know, we've been talking here about, you know, when a user does something that that is out of the ordinary. Well, in a lot of organizations, it's, sometimes it's d difficult to determine what the ordinary is, what's, what's normal for an end user. Um, so my question to the audience is, do you have a way to tell that now? Uh, your answers are A, yes, I'm confident we would recognize an imposter on the network, or B, yes, we have a way to, to monitor that, but I'm not sure whether we would recognize a sophisticated attacker. Uh, or C, no, we don't have a good baselining method, or, or D, I don't know. So um, please, with the, uh, if, if uh, you're in the audience, will you please uh, answer that question? Um, guys, uh, let me ask you th that question again uh, uh, to you. Do you. When you talk to uh, customers, or, work, or John, when you work with the enterprises, um, you know, do they generally have a way to, to recognize you know, what's normal on the, on the user's case, or, or is that out of the ordinary? This is John, and I would say uh, for the majority of the people I work with, it's pretty uncommon. You know, can I uh, jump in on that, John, and um, and, and share an experience that, that, that I have? Sure. Yeah, cool. So I have been in, in data analytics for, for a really mm -hmm. long time, as that's sort of what my academic background is. And, you know, time and time again, I have found that the, um, the best anomaly detection that I have ever seen done on large amounts of data was done by a human who had access to the right tools to get to that data, right? So, um, so sort of the, the gut feel um, of the operator um, saying, hey, this is not usual or this odd, that's strange, that is usually how an investigation truly begins into finding an imposter uh, on the network. Now, it is important we make a distinction here because um, you know, obviously an, an individual operator cannot, you know, cannot look at 100 million events per hour, and therefore, um, you know, technologies to sort, search, and analyze and abstract that data are key, important. But I don't believe it is possible to entirely cut the human out of the loop to make the end decision on the evidence collected is yes, this is. You know, this is immediately actionable, or or no, we, um, uh, you know, this is safe and expected. So there's, um, it really is auxiliary to the individual, and those individuals are are few and far between in organizations. I rarely see people invest in them. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Vince, and I think you know, t to build on that point, it's, you know, it's it, it's our job, if you will. Um, to get prioritized information to that operator, right? And, and to do that in a way, I don't think, you know, the robots may be taken over in a lot of places, but this isn't one area where we're going to see them anytime soon. Um, the, um, you know, it, it's our job to surface uh, the information to the human operator and, and, you know, to tie it back to the question, you know, do, do people have the ability baseline, you know, I, I think it really, the answer is going to somewhat depend on how wide a net they cast. I think a lot of organizations, for example, can could probably find a change in login, log off time pretty easy. Um, and they, you know, they, they're probably going to be able to flag you know, logins from geolocations that are, it's just impossible. Um, you know, that that's not so far afield that, that people are, are doing that commonly. We just start to really broaden that out and say, what are all the data sets um, that we can pull together, um, and, and you know, do we have that that full richness of the data available to us to then be filtered up to the operator? That's where I think it's going to start to break down a little bit. Well, let me um, uh, uh, give you a sense for what our audience said on this topic. Um, we had a very few people, uh, just as John had said uh, initially, very few people who feel confident that not only do they have a way to, to baseline normal user behavior, but they feel confident that they'd uh, be able to recognize an imposter. Um, about, the, about the same number who said, uh, 
uh, it was a rough tie between the, the folks who said, yes, I have a way to, to do the baselining, but I'm not sure if I'd recognized a, a, an atta a sophisticated attacker. And then we had uh, the, the largest response was 40% uh, said, no, we don't have a good baselining method. So uh, I think it emphasizes what, what you all have been saying, which is that um, you know you got to start somewhere uh, with a with some method of of understanding what normal is before you can really recognize those imposters. Um, maybe uh, one way to sort of address that a little bit is, and you, and you talked about a couple of methods um, just now, you know, in terms of understanding, you know, from logs, you know, when users log on, you know, how long they're on, what systems they're, they're going to. Those are things that you might be able to, to do on, on a basic level. Maybe you want to give us some sense for, you know, kind of what the next step is in, in baselining. What are, what are some of the tools you can use to understand user behavior and what are some of the, the, pro, the practices that maybe some of these folks who are in this 40% should be thinking about doing right now? I don't know, Mike, that might be a good one for you. Yeah, and I, you know, I think in, in terms of um, if you want to really be able to start to understand normal as it relates to user behavior, um, you're going to need a, a way to, to collect a lot of information um, and, and then to apply, you know, you, all, all of the buzzwords are going to come in here, Tim, right? Data science, machine learning, algorithms. Um, it, it, it happens to be true, but but it's, it's not something that you can do in a spreadsheet, right? So, so you're going to need uh, a, a good data collector, and depending on the type of behavior you're looking at, if you're focused, you know, on user behavior, I'm obviously partial to ours. Um, and if, uh, you know, if you're looking at a different, uh, you know, at network behavior, um, you know, I think there are some real advantages to an approach that's, that's looking at flows over perhaps, you know, some deep packet cracking type solutions. Um, but I'd defer to Vince on that. Um, which, so you need to collect some data, and then you need you need to give it a little bit of time, not extensive amounts of time, um, to let to let the artificial intelligence, if you will, um, you know, understand what normal is. And kind of key in that is you have to decide what you're going to compare to. So are you going to compare a person to their historical self? That, that can be very powerful and help you flag some things. But you can also apply uh, or compare people to peer groups. Um, so I can I can. Uh, uh, compare everyone in marketing, you know, I compare people in marketing against the rest of the group, um, and that will help me identify deviations in another layered approach. Um, but you also want to be able to build um, kind of groups within the company that are based on observed behaviors. Um, you know, I think it was John that alluded to earlier um, that you have, you know, users outside of groups um, that are trying to access things they shouldn't be accessing. You know, it, it, it's unfortunate, but the org chart and the um, and the uh, the way that translates down to IT doesn't always set up quite right. And people get uh, delegated responsibilities, or they have them taken away, or they change positions within a company, and their responsibilities change, and what they're doing, what that pattern um, is, changes over time. But it isn't always neatly reflected by the people in marketing or now, you know, maybe that one person is doing something a little different. So if you have a way to build those, build those user groups based on observed behaviors and then detect changes versus those groups that exist within the company, then you've really laid it on a third powerful layer to help you detect anomalies strictly in user behavior. Vince, did you want to talk a little bit about the, the network side? Uh, yeah, Mike, and, and fundamentally, you you are absolutely right that you know, the first step in this process is one of telemetry, and it's also by far um, the most uh, uh, often where people simply stop. It's like, yeah, I collect data on my network, I send my logs to a to a to a SIM system, and and I'm covered. And and that is that is sort of the sadness of it, because the, the truth of the matter is, and we can you know we can bring in many metaphors here. But would you, you know, would you ever trust somebody that looks at one data source alone and says, geez, I am all set, I'm, I'm good, I can see everything now? Well, you don't do that. You set up in any defensive uh, situation, whether that be in a kinematic scenario or in a network defensive scenario, you set up telemetry in as many points where you can collect data as you possibly can, even if you're not going to do any advanced analytics on that today, 
collecting the data is important for many reasons. What if something did happen? Investigations into what happens on the network, what data was moved, what systems were touched, who was on those systems, right? Typically, in our experience, it takes up five to six weeks for the average compromise to be detected. Most people don't even have data that reaches back that far. And I'm, and I'm not even talking about, geez, 20% of my network traffic went to China on that day. I'm actually talking about very high detail, full fidelity information, what connections were made, when, where, and how long. Just collecting that information from as many points as possible already gets you way ahead of what most people are doing, um, are doing out there. It allows you to do troubleshooting, fault analysis. It allows you to do baselining. It allows you to take it as far as full behavioral analytics, right? And that is sort of where, you know, where I'll back you up on that one too, Mike, because behavioral analytics isn't just, um, you know, yesterday it was this, this thing was this big and today the thing is a little bit bigger, right? Behavioral analytics is, is rooted in, in deep um, mathematics that, you know, that we, that we have to very carefully apply to remain scalable in organizations where network events or host events are in the hundreds of millions to the billions per hour. Right? There, there are cause and effect relationships um, that are carefully tracked, um, you know, the ones of interest selected, groupings made, so that one can point out when behaviors are changing. But behaviors by themselves, that's one thing. I'm looking for a static behavior like, geez, there's a port scan uh, sweeping through my network, you know, that is one. But a change in behavior is even more interesting. You know, this computer made um, 20 connections an hour um, um, you know, in the last couple of weeks, then the behavior changed very rapidly to making a thousand connections per minute, right? That is the behavior the operator needs to, needs to know about, not the fact that there was a behavior because there are many legitimate scenarios where a thousand connections per second is what you'd like to see, right? So it's the, the analytics you do on that that gives you then subsequently the leg up on the telemetry that, that, that you've collected. I want to be uh, uh, conscious of our time and make sure we get uh, a, 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 an opportunity for to get to our audience questions. So I'm going to um, move uh, forward to uh, to the Q and A. I want to ask our audience uh, first of all, though, if if they would please fill out the feedback form that's open on your computer. To complete the form, please press the submit answer button at the bottom of the page. Thanks in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in the survey allows us to better serve you. Um, and just a reminder: if you'd like to ask a question. Um, uh, just type the question into the text box located below the media player and then click the submit question button. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in that I think are, are you know, right on topic here. Um, and uh, there's, there's a real simple one that, uh, that I want to relate to you. Our, our one member of the audience asks, if you were going to take two or three steps immediately to try and detect rogue users, what would you do? Um, uh, John, do you want to take a crack at that? Uh, I'd point back to the two detection and prevention slides that I, point, uh, that I had earlier. Um, start looking at the logs and make sure that you're getting them from your endpoints and disable some of those service creation uh, things. Um, and definitely audit your file shares uh, and make sure that uh, you're tracking some of that, those failed uh, login attempts to the network shares because that will help turn up some good, good events. Yeah, fundamentally, I think John's answer can be summarized as, one, make sure you start collecting the data. Two, make sure you're actually looking at it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, the, you know, if you look at some of the breaches that have happened, you know, it's a matter of folks not you know, having the data but not looking at it. So. Um, we had another question to uh, you know from the audience that uh, you know basically asked the question, how do you know who the imposter is? Um, do you guys have any any you know words of wisdom there? Um, you know we've talked about uh, you know some of the, we can monitor some of the behaviors. Um, you know are there any other ways that we can use to to recognize you know a user as an imposter? 
You know, I, I think we touched on a high level on, um, on quite a few of them. Um, you know, some of the other things that you, can, that you can look at, you know, off the top of my head, you know, if you're seeing a sudden change in, um, in work hours, you know, when somebody's logged in, a deviation from an established pattern, um, that could suggest, um, you know, that, that, would, that would register as a radar blip, to use the term Vince used earlier, um, uncommon use of resources or accesses. Um, you know, those types of things. Weird usage of remote access. If somebody's in the office and they're connected, why do they also have a remote connection at the same time? It doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, there could be a reason, but it's uncommon. You know, another radar blip that bears another look. Um, you know, certainly logging in from, from two different geographic locations, I think I mentioned earlier, in a tight time frame. Those would be, you know, kind of some quick, you know, sort of in that low-hanging fruit uh, category that I think you know you, you can you can start to target in, and then you know before before anybody else answers, just to, on the previous question, since it was a little broader on rogue users, um, you know keep an eye on people that you think are getting ready to leave your company, and and, and that's probably enough to say at this point. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, we had a, another question uh, from the audience. Um, how important is a post breach data pop? policy to have and I think I think what they're getting at here is you know once once you've recognized that that imposter uh, is is on your network um, and uh, you know do you have a plan for what you're going to do about it um, do you guys want to talk about you know um, what what sorts of plans should should folks have in pl in place uh, should they find an imposter on the network Tim, I'd like to take a crack at answering that. Well, just offering one observation before I let the others answer that. Um, you know, in in organizations where we where we help, um, one of the big key challenges people have to overcome is to simply get the mandate to be allowed to do something about it, right? So the the um, when it comes to detecting um, activities that are undesirable. Um, to have the mandate and either uh, you know, block them, uh, shut them off, or to put further investigative practices into play, um, sometimes collide with policy on business continuity, policy on privacy for the individuals, uh, and what have you. Um, so some of the challenges here might not necessarily be um, technical. They may much more be on the business political end. Does anybody else want to? Uh, take a crack at that. I agree with you, Vince. The, um, and it, it's 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 sort of interesting, though, to think about it. You know, we, we talk a lot about instant response plans. Uh, um, do you know is this a, is this a piece of that plan, or is this something different? You know, as we look at uh, John, I know you've done a lot with with incident response. Do, do you do you you know does it matter who the uh, the compromise comes from? Does that change your plan at all? Not so much. I mean, part of it will depend on it'll, it'll help you determine your path for investigating systems, and you know, if you know who it was, that might give you a better idea of what their intent was. So, you can look for additional systems and figure out what maybe uh, what they were after and, and targeting that way. Um, but no, for the most part, the the IR process is going to stay the same. Um, it's just the key is actually having a process in place and and regularly. Uh, making sure that you run through scenarios that you're practicing these these tools and techniques during incidents so that you when something happens that you're prepared and ready to go Great. well we're just about at the top of the hour here um, at, I'll ask um, uh, Vincent and, and Mike if, do you have any uh, you know, sort of parting thoughts that that you want to pass along before we close out yeah, for, for me, Tim, um, first I, I want to say that this was great and a lot of fun, and thank you, John and Vince, and uh, I have a lot of respect for the audience because I think we got very honest answers in those poll questions, and, and I, I've been on some and seen some poll questions where the, the answers were a little bit more uh, spurious. Um, you know, I, I think the, the underlying thing, I think Vince uh, summed it up very well earlier, um, you got to collect the data and you got to have a way to look at the data. Um, and I think that there is a lot more data available than is being levered, you know, as we've seen in some of the poll questions here um, by some of the folks here. And I just encourage them to get out and take a look at what's possible. Um, 
and, and, and see how that might help them improve their security postures, both, you know, directly, you know, as relates to an imposter, um, and then also, you know, broadened out beyond that into some of the other, you know, types of threats and risks that we talked about today. Great. Vince, any, any parting thoughts? Well, I, I think I'll just add to what Mike said. By you know, if you're not looking, um, you're not gonna you're not gonna find it. And that is not just a matter of of which tools and telemetry do you put in place, but do you also make available in your organization that individual that is given the mandate to do that that cyber hunting, that that searching and seeking and investigating threats that look out of the ordinary, sometimes possibly not following a process that you have put in place uh, up front but instead give them the ability to truly go out and actively try to defend your organization. So that is a, that's a thought I'll, I'll leave you with, and, and, and thank you for organizing this, Tim. For more information related to today's webinar, please visit any of the resource links open before you. There's a bunch of good links there in terms of um, uh, both from Dark Reading and, and from uh, some of the folks here on how to find out more about this. Um, within the next 24 to 48 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Additionally, you can view today's event on demand by visiting http colon backslash backslash www.darkreading.com slash events. Thank you for attending today's webinar, uh, Imposters, Rogue Users, and Other Unwelcome Guests on Your Network, brought to you by Spectrosoft and Dark Reading. This webinar is copyright 2015 by United Business Media Limited. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted, if that's the case, by Dark Reading and Spectrosoft, who are solely responsible for its content, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. On behalf of today's guests, John Sawyer, Vince Burke, and Mike Tierney, I'm Tim Wilson. Thanks for your time, and have a great day.